Good afternoon. Thank you to the children of the Circle School. Let's applaud them as they come down the runway. The Peace School in San Antonio. And welcome to the 25th anniversary of the Peace Center. Um, 25 years ago this year, in a couple of months, Anne and I met at Mama's Cafe on Nagadocious, Cappy. And little did we know that we were going to become the Lucy and Ethel of peacemaking in San Antonio. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how we were going to do it. We just felt called to bring some peace and some compassion to the city that we love. So here's the best part. Our biscuits and coffee were on the house because the wait staff had so much fun watching us talk and talk and talk and talk <laughs> for three hours. They said we couldn't possibly charge you all. So that's worth it. You talk about peace, you get some free biscuits and coffee. It's all good. So as you might imagine, here's Lucy and here's Ethel. <laughs> So over the years as the Peace Center, actually from the very beginning as it formed, but still, we always point to the children. And so we wanted to start today. Uh, we point to the children, we point to the future generations. So even in every event, in each piece of work that we do, we consider how will this impact our children, our children's children, and all of our future generations. So we really thought it was appropriate um, to start that way today. And even though we started this work as the Peace Center, we are officially announcing today that we are now doing business as Compassionate San Antonio. Yay! Because what we've discovered in our own learning process, that the practices of compassion are precisely the things that make for peace. Practices of compassion are precisely the things that make for peace. And so our plan and our intent is to continue to plant compassion into the future. And um, so you'll see and hear a lot about trees today. So we're planting together. So 14 years ago, we got the idea of inviting all the people who wanted to come to be blessed as peacemakers in their lives, in their families, in our community. Some of the people showed up and thought they were going to be introduced to peacemakers and were surprised to find out that it was them that we were blessing. So we did that for about three or four years and it started to catch on. It started to really have some resonance with people that once you're blessed into an aff affirmation of being a peacemaker, you start looking at your life differently. You start feeling that call to make peace wherever you are found. The other thing we did after about four or five years was we decided that just like all around the world there are poet laureates who are lifted up in the community, we decided that we needed to begin lifting people up um, in our community who had practiced this a long time, but to call them Peace Laureates. And the first Peace Laureate was Dr. Ruth Lofgren, who did a lot with the environment. Patricia shaking her head there. And to transform Mitchell Lake into the Audubon Lake now down at, um, on the south side of San Antonio. Because you know those, um, you know, migrating birds love all the stuff that Mitchell Lake had in it. And so their patterns for flight were right over there. So transforming it into the, into the Audubon, into the gardens down there was just a lovely, a lovely thing. And every year since then, we have had a total now of 18 Peace Laureates, I believe, including this year we have 18. 
So we have a really nice, lovely history of our laureates and the peacemaking uh, in San Antonio. And in fact, we wouldn't be here today without all the decades of people who have gone before us. Um, the blessing of the peacemakers is always on this Sunday, and there's a reason for that. There's an international season for nonviolence that was begun by the United Nations, and it marks the assassination date of uh, Gandhi and 64 days until the assassination of Martin Luther King. So that's the season for nonviolence, and I believe the date for Gandhi is the 31st of January. So next year's will actually be on January 31st. It will fall on that date. And that's why we hold it now. So um, what we'd like to do, though, at this point is to recognize our previous laureates that are here in the room. And I'm reading this from our new book called Heartwood that you'll all want at least three copies of before you leave. Um, as Rosalind mentioned, Dr. Ruth Lofgren, um, was Ruth 100? I know, but was she was 100 when she passed, right? Just shy. So she's not with us. Some of you know Reverend Claude Black. He also is not with us, but in spirit very much. And then there's Jane and Woody Tuck, also not with us any longer. That was 2010. But, and I'm going to invite them to stay standing, Patty and Rod Radel, 2011. Many of you know their work. I don't see them. Is Omar Shakir in the room? Uh, Omar Imam Omar Shakir, 2012. Um, 2013, we gave it to the entire batch of those nuns over at Incarnate Word. But we're going to invite any of those that are in the room, Martha Ann and Alice Holden are here, but we gave it to the whole batch for their amazing work they've done over the years. Sam and Lynn Stahl, Rabbi Stahl, did Lynn come with you today? Okay, great. Uh, I'm not sure if Rosie Castro is in the room. I haven't seen her today. 2015. Uh, 2016 was Father Ron Rollheiser right here at um, Oblate. He was supposed to be landing, so we're hoping to still get to see him. But they have done a lot here for interfaith work and keeping the community going. Uh, 2017, Dr. Rajam Ramamurthy. She's there, and her husband is here as well. She continues to do hard labor as well. I, get, I put her to work all the time. Anyway, 2018 was T.C. Calvert and Mario Salas. I hear Mario's here. Last year, my goodness, we packed the place. 2019, Patricia Castillo, Rebecca Flores, and Nikki Valdez. Tres amigas. Thank you all for all your work. Um, we are selling these books at the end, and these folks will be inside this room to autograph your three books or more that you're buying. So, thank you. So, I'd like for you just to look around the room. We are so grateful to all of you peacemakers who are here this afternoon. If we had a mirror, you could take the mirror out and look in the mirror because you are definitely among the peacemaking people in our world right now. One logistical point, if you, how many, if, how many of you, this is the first time that you've been to Oblate School of Theology in this building here, Whitley Center? Whoa, whoa, oh my, sweet. Okay, well welcome, welcome, welcome. So uh, here's a logistical point. If you go out the door to your right and take your first left down the hallway, the restrooms are located right there and the refreshments are in that. So R&R, &R, restrooms, refreshments, right down that way, okay? So you're gonna be hearing a lot today about what this compassion means and the Charter for Compassion, but we're going to hear the Charter and I'm gonna invite you to all stand with me in that. And we'll be hearing it on the screen. You'll find it in your packet as well. But I want to invite you to imagine that we're standing in a circle. You're going to see on the screen a group of people who are speaking, but they have like a group of people behind them. So just imagine that we're filling out that entire circle with them. 
The principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious, ethical, and spiritual traditions. Calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. Compassion impels us to work tirelessly to alleviate the suffering of our fellow creatures. To dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put another there. To honor the inviolable sanctity of every single human being. Treating everybody without exception. With absolute justice, equity, and respect. It is also necessary in both public and private life to refrain consistently and empathically from inflicting pain. To act or speak violently out of spite, chauvinism, or self-interest. To impoverish, exploit, or deny basic rights to anybody. And to incite hatred by denigrating others, even our enemies. Is a denial of our common humanity. We acknowledge that we have failed to live compassionately. And that some have even increased the sum of human misery in the name of religion. We therefore call upon all men and women to restore compassion to the center of morality and religion. To return to the ancient principle that any interpretation of scripture that breeds violence, hatred, or disdain is illegitimate. To ensure that youth are given accurate and respectful information about other traditions, religions, and cultures. To encourage a positive appreciation of cultural and religious diversity. To cultivate an informed empathy with the suffering of all human beings. Even those as enemies. We urgently need to make compassion a clear, luminous, and dynamic force in our polarized world. Rooted in a principled determination to transcend selfishness. Compassion can break down political, dogmatic, ideological, and religious boundaries. Born of our deep interdependence, compassion is essential for human relationships and to a fulfilled humanity. It is the path to enlightenment and indispensable in the creation of a just economy and a peaceful global community. Thank you. You may be seated. God, our love, on who 
whom we thrive. You the root, we the branches, we will enflesh your flower of life. God, our love, on whom we thrive. You the root, we the branches, we will enflesh your flower of love. Hello, peacemakers. I'm Susan, and I'm going to be introducing our peace laureates to you. But first of all, thank you. This was Jose Ruben de Leon on the piano with the vocals. What a blessing it is to have him sing for us. Um, I'd like to start by showing you a short video by Karen Armstrong, who wrote the Charter for Compassion. And this is a small talk, a very short talk, that she gave at Compassionate Monterey in October, our sister city, Mayor Nuremberg. Um, and it explains how we chose this year's Peace Laureates. We pay attention to what Karen has to say. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to talk to you all. Who would have thought 10 years since we founded the Charter for Compassion? Uh, what a long journey. Um, and I particularly wanted to say how sorry I am not to be able to be with you all today. Uh, it's such an important occasion. I had a wonderful talk just a couple of days ago with our new ED, David Darlene. And he suggested, for example, that we might want to revisit the original charter that was written 10 years ago in Geneva by leading representatives of, of seven major world religions who wrote the original Charter for Compassion and bring it up to date, making it speak to some of the problems that we're wrestling with today. This is an anniversary. And when you have an anniversary, you look back at the past. You look back at beginnings, but it's also a time to look forward to the future. And first of all, when I look back at the past, there are lots and lots of people to thank, of course. Ted, above all, who started the whole thing. Joan Brown Campbell, who was such a valiant leader for so many years. Marilyn Turkovich, and of course, Christina, who's arranged this extraordinary event for you all. I think the first 10 years of the Charter have been characterized by talk. Uh, after all, the Charter began as a TED talk. Ted has this wonderful idea of ideas that change the world. And my talk was beamed around the world, it went viral, and spread the news of the Charter. But ideas themselves don't change the world. They also need action. So there are three things that I'd like to leave you with. As you leave this lovely haven you're having in Monterey, this lovely time of uh, communication and peace, Remember, you're going back to the marketplace, as the Buddha said. Secondly, we have a lot to learn from business people, as I found in both Seattle and Pakistan. Business people uh, know how to take a quixotic idea and translate it into practical, effective action. They know how to pilot something, how to try something out. They're not afraid of failure. Uh, and they, need, they always have to make something work. 
and that is an ethos that I think we really need in the Charter. And finally, I want to go back to Confucius. Like all the great purveyors of the Golden Rule, Confucius insisted that we could not confine our compassion to our own group. Compassion has to spread out. He saw it in a series of concentric circles. First, it starts in the family where you learn about compassion. But then you have to move out to include within your radius of compassion the city, the whole city in which you're living. But that's not enough. You then have to extend your benevolence to the whole country. And finally, the Confucians said, to the whole world. Love your enemies, said Jesus. Uh, reach out to all tribes and nations, says the Quran. Compassion can, may start at home, but it can never end there. Thank you, Karen Armstrong. Today we'll be honoring three men who were able to take a quixotic idea and turn it into action. They've proven that. So for those of you who haven't figured it out yet, first I'll announce who our three peace laureates are, Kathy Lawton, G.P. Singh, and Lionel Sosa. And we look forward to hearing their wisdom, first of all, from Cappy Lawton, who many of you know as a restaurateur. But he didn't start out that way. He started out as an aeronautical draftsman. Can you picture that? I can't. But he had an idea. He has a theory of life that when you're ready to change your life, you need three plans, one, two, three, all of them good plans that you'd be willing to follow. So his first plan, was a beauty salon. I can't picture that either. Sorry, Gabby. The second plan was maybe movie theaters. The third plan was restaurants. He didn't know anything about restaurants except how to eat in them and how to enjoy good food. But that's what he decided upon. Because I think what Cappy saw was an opportunity to make community. Sociologists have a concept they call the third place. We have our home, we have our work or our school, and then we have that third place where maybe everybody knows your name, where you go to celebrate a graduation or a straight A report card or a marriage or an anniversary, or maybe it's where you go when you're lonely or you're bored or you need cheering up. It's a place where you can talk because the acoustics are fantastic. Nobody can hear you, but you can hear each other when you're sitting at the same table. And the waiters are so good. They have this waiter magic that they know when you're out of iced tea and your glass is refilled, you never know they were there. They're magical places, these third places. And over his lifetime, Cappy has started 29 of them. There are three of them still here in San Antonio. Um, Cappy's on Broadway and right next door Cappuccino's and La Fonda on Main and there's soon to be a fourth because in the 1980s he ran Mama's Cafe and then it's been leased out for about 30 years and it's just about to open again under Cappy rain. And Kathy, when you do open up Mama's Cafe, Rosalind sort of stole my thunder. Rosalind and Anne will be glad to point out the corner where they were sitting so you can put a brass plaque there. <laughs> because that's the kind of things that happen at these perfect restaurants that Kathy runs. That people have meetings, they meet people, they form community. Let me tell you one story about Cappy that I think tells you what kind of a man he is. You might remember a few years ago there was a terrible fire at Cappy's restaurant. They were shut down for 72 days. That would be terrible for the staff, wouldn't it? Out of work for 72 days? But not with Cappy, he paid them. Cappy takes care of his people. He takes care of his community. He does things under the radar like planting trees and helping local artisans with his business. But 
I want to hear from somebody who knows Kathy really well. And so, actually, two somebodies. So I'd like to invite his son, Trevor, and his daughter, Avery, up here to tell you a little bit more about Kathy. Good afternoon. I'm Avery. I'm Kathy's daughter. This is my brother, Trevor, his son. And I apologize, I'm going to go off script just a little bit. And I know you told me two to three minutes, but you invited two Lawtons to speak about a third Lawton, so I apologize. Um, I'm going to reference something you said, and you should always have three plans, correct? So I had three plans. My first plan was to talk about his heart. The second plan was to talk about trees. And the third was to make my brother write it. I promise, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but I had no idea what this was today. And I had no idea you were being honored with such incredible human beings. Um, this is pretty special. I went with trees. I've already apologized to Paul and to Christina. Um, but yes, trees. Not food, but trees. Trees represent life and growth, and peace, and nature. Dad has always told us that his religion is nature. Trees provide us with many benefits necessary for survival, clean air, filtered water, shade, food. They give us a sense of security, of hope, and insight. They demonstrate the courage to persevere even in the toughest conditions. Trees teach us to stay rooted while we soar to reach our highest potential. The kids sing about that. I sent this to my brother at midnight last night. These were not my words. These were the words of all the, the, the being in Mother Nature, right? And every word we may call he, she, it that we believe in channeled through me to you all today. Well, Avery went very off script. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, she mentioned to me the other day that she wanted to talk about trees, and uh, I said that's absolutely what we should talk about. Um, we often refer to them as Cappy Appleseed. <laughs> um, and Cappy has always shared all of his gifts and all of his being with his children. And we, um, aside from us, he has also shared uh, so much with the thousands of employees that he has been able to have a true impact on, on the lives of, um, and have become a very much an extended part of our family. We probably have the largest family in San Antonio. Um, and what I told Avery is we should really Another thing we could contribute to is, is the how many of the mentees that he has had through his life. The willing or the unsuspecting ones? Yeah. <laughs> Most often unsuspecting. <laughs> um, just in how much he has really contributed to the community of San Antonio, which he just, he loves so much. Um, Cappy has planted several hundreds, if not thousands, of trees across San Antonio and um, planting trees is often the first thing that he does when he goes into a project. Um, Avery's house is a definite... 30, 31? 31. He topped that at Mama's Cafe with 32. <laughs> um, and uh, Cappy has sown so many seeds of life, growth, hope, and insight through his gifts of time, treasure, and talents. And... We are so pleased he is being recognized today. There's a quote by Martin Luther, which we feel sums up both our father's heart and his character. Even if I knew tomorrow that the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. Daddy?
some of you know that I, uh, last February, was diagnosed with cancer. And I have to tell you that um, it makes you a little overly emotional, all the things that they do to you and treat you. But thank goodness I'm, I'm free of it. Um, It's a real bummer when your children get a far more articulate than you are, so uh, I feel like I'm doing a bad job of cleanup here. Um, I'm the wrong person to be honored, but I, I know that a lot of the people here are here because of their great respect and appreciation for Rosalind and for Anne, for I love Ethel and Lucy. I, I really like that. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm on a, that may be semi-permanent. Um, and I know far better and for a long time. And when she calls, somehow or another, she asks you to do something, but it's really more in the form of telling you to do something. And she gave fairly short notice on this. And it wasn't something that I could easily say no to until I thought about it for a while and then it was too late. Um, if there's anybody that deserves to be honored for peacemaking, it's Ann Helmke. And I noticed that she's not officially on the list, but I sure would like to nominate her for next year. And um, I, feel very undeserving to be here, but I'll, I'll uh, r ramble on for a minute here. I had a few thoughts I was going to say, but one of them is when I was studying engineering and business in college, I thought about it one day and I thought, you know, I know what history is, I know what biology is, I know what chemistry is, I know what engineering is, but what in the heck is business? I really didn't know what business was. In the 60s, by the way, when you were majoring in business, it didn't exactly have a great resonance to it. It's like, you're going to be a businessman? Um, so I went to the Trinity Library. I went to SAC as long as they'd have me, but I used to study at Trinity because the girls were prettier. And... Uh, so I pulled out, I remember, 16 dictionaries and looked up the word business. I thought, I'm going to be a business major. And th there really were 16 very different definitions. Only four of them mentioned profit. And the one I really that made the most sense to me was organized activity which I envisioned sort of as the scale of justice, that somehow or another, the more you organize things, the less active they become. And the more active they become, often the less organized that they are. And so the whole idea of business in my mind from that point was, how could you balance the two? The structure of many things today is often trying, trying, trying to get them more organized. More laws, more governance. Less trust in per people's judgment. That tends to make things very, very inactive. Extremely inactive. Then there's the chaos of no governance. And what that causes. I have a dear friend who's Former, the, he's former head of, of, of the government department at UTSA, Mansoor El Kiki. A lot of you know Mansoor. And Mansoor is going back and back and back to his home country of Libya, which has no governance at the moment, zero. Can't even imagine that. So I'm proud to say that I studied business. Did I learn how to do all that? No, nobody does. Nobody knows how to do it. But I know a lot of people, particularly in this room, when you hear the word business, it has a connotation to it. So 
maybe I can help dispel that a little bit. Um, I want to say to you, I'm, I want, I, I think you understand this, but I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I got to be born. I don't remember anybody ever asking me where I wanted to be born or how I wanted to be born or what size, shape, color, religion, any of those kinds of things I wanted to be. But imagine, how could you be luckier than to be born where we've all been born? Most of us have been born, the United States of America. How could we be more fortunate to be healthy, reasonably intelligent? All the things that we got, often that people are way, way too arrogant about and proud of. It, it's always made no sense to me. And I think I'm about the luckiest guy in the world. Com combine that with the fact that I, I found my soulmate. For, for those of you that, that know Susie well, you understand very clearly that Cappy gets credit for a lot of things that Susie does. I get to love my son. I get to love my daughter. They're absolutely incredible people. They've met and married people that I love. I couldn't imagine have a better son-in-law and a better daughter-in-law than I have and grandchildren that I have. I'm a very, very, very lucky guy and I very much appreciate it. I'm also in a business that I just absolutely love. How many people do we all know that got to be doctors or lawyers or Indian chiefs or heads of this or heads of that and, they, and, and they'd never really loved what they did? I still love what I do. I love being in the restaurant business because it was something I knew absolutely nothing about except the fact that I love Samuel Pepys, I mean, Johnson, Pepys, Boswell, when I was in college. I loved their literature, but I loved more about reading about them as humans and that they hung out in coffee houses a lot and they talked about really esoteric and heady things and that they envisioned a better world and a better place. And I thought later in life, I want to create places like that where people can do that kind of thing. The third place, as Carol described. I hope that our restaurants have been a third place for a lot of you in this room. They certainly have been for me and my family, and we're very proud of what we do. Um, I, I believe that life is also extremely paradoxical. I don't deserve to be called a peacemaker. Most people that work with me know me long time and everything else would say, that isn't a word I'd use to describe Cappy. <laughs> I'm a fighter. I get way too angry about things. As Avery reminded me this morning, I hold a grudge too long, way too long. And uh, I read a when I was, I thought, you know, I don't even know what, isn't it fun to rethink basic concepts like peace and peacemaker? So I went last night, one of the many nights I can't sleep very well, and I read a lot about peace. What is peace? Well, the overwhelming word, most repetitive word about peace is tranquility. Hell, it's not anything I've ever had much of in my life. And peacemaker. I don't know, but I read a great quote, and I'm going to save it, and I'm going to say it. I believe that if you find things that are resonate with you, that you should say them for 30 days in a row. So my new one is, holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> so I'm going to remember that one. And that Benjamin Franklin said, there was never a good war or a bad peace. Those both really resonated with me. And 
I'm, I'm very concerned about global warming. I'm very concerned about the way we're treating our immigration policies and our immigrants in our country. I'm very concerned about the bipolar nature of our country today and the anger that exists in the, in the people that so firmly convinced that they know right from wrong and that it's not the same as other people. And I'm very concerned about lack of religious freedom and, and acceptance in other people. I'm angry. And I wish I weren't. And I don't think I deserve being called a peacemaker. I wish I were better at it. I'm working on it every day. I'm, I know one of the things that I admire about my friend Lionel and my friend GP, that they're incredible listeners. They're very, very patient and they're very good listeners. I'm not. I wish I were. My son reminds me a lot. And I'm working on it. Well, <laughs> thank you for honoring me and my family. We really appreciate it. I'll work better to deserve it. The second peacemaker we'll be honoring today is G.P. Singh. And I love the story of how you got here. He got his undergraduate engineering degree in his um, home country of India, and then got a scholarship to Drexel University in Philadelphia, where my father went, incidentally, when it was still Drexel Institute of Technology on the GI Bill after World War II, until they figured out he had dropped out of high school in ninth grade and kicked him out. But I've always um, considered myself a, a friend of Drexel University. But on the flight over, he had a layover in Paris, and he was a little hungry. So he stopped and got an omelet, and he didn't quite understand the exchange rate. It ended up being $3. So he depleted his life savings by one-third. And I think of the bravery of that, coming to a strange country with eight bucks in your pocket and blowing a third of it on an omelet in Paris. My kind of guy. <laughs> So after he graduated from Drexel, we're talking around 1979 now, he'd been to San Antonio on a conference and he really liked it. And I saw it in writing, you wrote this down, GP, that you liked the hot climate, the hot food, and the hot people. <laughs> but he thought it would be a really good place to raise a family where he and Winky could bring up their four sons. So he moved to San Antonio and he was the first turban sick to move into our city in 1979. So he was a research engineer for Southwest Research Institute. About a decade later, he started teaching at UTSA, and soon afterwards, he started his own company, Carta Technologies, which had its fingers in just about everything in its heyday. It employed more than 400 people and was in 20 different locations around the world. These are 400 fantastic jobs, Mayor Nirenberg, the kind you would have bring to San Antonio. These are jobs for engineers and scientists and information technology people. And he used this to increase the sick community too because he realized that he and his small family wouldn't have much of a community. You know, Lynn Stahl, it reminds me of your family luring Rabbi Stahl to Michigan so that you could marry a rabbi. <laughs> so GP lured Sikhs here with their good jobs, well-educated people. And now we have a Sikh community here in San Antonio of 250 families that contribute a lot to our community. 
Carta technology was sold oh, about a decade ago, a little bit more than that, but GP's remained extremely active in the community, in his own community, as part of the SICK Foundation on a nationwide level, but also in our San Antonio community, um, on the board of a lot of philanthropic organizations like the Santicos Foundation, and speaking nationwide, worldwide, about the need for interreligious tolerance. Um, we had in mind one of your sons to come and speak, and um, he wasn't available. It's the one who lives in New York. And GP said, oh, that's okay. All my sons can speak. And that's probably the, the greatest tribute that a father can give to his sons, that all of his sons can speak in public. What a way to bring up kids. Three of them are Trinity graduates, and the fourth is from UTSA. Um, but to hear a little bit more about this wonderful man who landed in our midst with $8 minus an omelet in his pocket and has turned into somebody who is indispensable for our life here in San Antonio today. I'd like to invite up his son, um, Gupal. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mayor Nuremberg, past and current uh, honorees. Um, it's a great privilege and honor to introduce uh, actually my uncle. I'm often called the fifth son, son but uh, my uncle to you, Dr. G.P. Singh. Um, perhaps, Cappy, um, the only thing luckier than being born here in San Antonio is not being born here but making your way here. And uh, myself, G.P., uh, Winky, uh, I think we're a living testament of that. Um, and GP's proof of the living the American dream. And I think you nicely described some of that journey. I was going to share some of that with you as well. But um, as he took the journey along the way, he led a life um, that uh, allowed him to also dedicate time throughout his journey to improving the lives of others and to community building. And you've heard about his arrival in, in Philadelphia and his early time here in San Antonio. You know, when he created those jobs in San Antonio, it was such a unique thing to see a man with a, a red turban building San Antonio's largest homegrown defense contracting company. And he served on many business boards and bank boards and even on the Federal Reserve Board. But he always remained humble and rooted in family and in faith. And I'd like to give you all some insight as to how he's wired. In our daily sick prayer, a prayer we call the Ardas, we end that prayer each day with a line Nanik nam jardikala tere bane sarbatabala. And I want to share the concise and literal translation of that line. It asks every Sikh to pray and ask Almighty God for the well being of all humanity, for the prosperity of everyone in the worldwide community, and for global peace on the entire planet. And that's what GP is most passionate about. That's what he enjoys thinking about, talking about, and taking action on. And he served our community for 20 years on various boards like the Catholic, Catholic Charities, United Way, Texas Public Radio, the Cancer Therapy and Research Center, and many, many others. And I think one of his greatest contributions to San Antonio that will benefit future generations to come is him serving as a confidant and mentor to John Santikos. And he advised Mr. Santikos to entrust his entire estate and bequeath it to the San Antonio Area Foundation. This resulted in $600 million going to the foundation to support local charitable organizations. 
He also dedicated his, his efforts to local Sikh community and led the effort to construct our Sikh temple, our Gudwara called Sikh Dharamsal. And this has really allowed us to pass on our values to future generations. And finally, he's a family man. He worked tirelessly to serve his family, both his immediate family, his extended family here in India and in the US. And he's worked hard to bring us together, keep us together. And now his passion is his five grandchildren ranging from four months to four years in age. Um, and GP's four sons are very proud of their parents' contribution. One of them has come down to surprise him today. Darsh, I'd like to have you stand up and, uh, and be acknowledged. I think as a tribute, let's recite together that line requesting blessings and global peace for the entire planet. Please repeat along with me. Nanak Nam. Jardi Kala, Tere Bane, Sarbata Bala. GP is an incredible role model and inspiration to me. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome GP Singh. Thank you, friends, and thank you to the Peace Center of San Antonio for this honor. Uh, thank you to my friend Anne uh, Helmke for inviting me to receive this award. And thank you to my fellow awardees, uh, Cappy Lawton and Lionel Sosa. All you have done and continue to do to make our city a better place for us all to live. Something we share in the, in the Sikh faith is equality. So when one of us is honored, we all are. So thank you to the community of Sikh Dharamsal and to my family who shared in the experience and enabled me to work with the community. Thank you to my kids, Darsh, Lakhpreet, Simran, Gunisha, Harpreet, Gurbans, Raj, and my nephews, Gurpal and Harvinder. Most of all, thank you to my wife. Many of, new, many of you know her as Vinky. Without her, I would not be able to serve the community. Let me tell you, she is the best. Thank you, Parvinder. I immigrated to USA 46 years ago, as I already told you about my journey in Philadelphia, five years to get a PhD degree, and then came to San Antonio for a conference. That was 1976. And I fought, just fell in love with this city. And I moved to San Antonio over 40 years ago, 1979. And you are right, it was hot, hot weather, hot food, hot people. <laughs> it is amazing to look back and see what a wonderful home it has been for us. We raised our kids here, we grew with community here, we cre created jobs, and we have fallen in love with our Spurs. Go Spurs, go. Uh, there is something special about the city that people keep trying to put their finger on, but we all have a hard time identifying exactly what it is that makes San Antonio so special. Whatever it is, I feel blessed to have found this place and to have made it my home and, and to be surrounded by wonderful, kind people who work hard and keep this a special place. I am so grateful for that. Like any other place though, San Antonio is not perfect. When I first moved here, I was the only Sikh who wore a turban. 
I dealt with my fair share of racism then, and as our family and community has grown, we have dealt with even more since. This is a reality of our experience here, and it has reminded us of the work we must do to create a better world for our children. This has been an important aspect of why so many of us, including me, have been so committed to ensuring more equality and justice here. Having been on the other side of hate, I wanted to use my growing privilege to help lift up those who are most vulnerable. This is what my Sikh faith teaches me too, that if we truly feel grateful for what we have, then we will feel naturally inclined to serve our communities. We refer to this loving service as seva, and it is a central part of Sikh principles. Serving others is not just about using our privileges to help others, which it is, of course, but it is also a way for us to express appreciation for our blessings. Seva is worship in action. This has been my motivation for giving me so much of my time to serve the San Antonio community, from serving on nonprofit boards, to funding nonprofit organizations, to starting some of our own from working with the city leaders and philanthropic organizations and local entrepreneurs, from serving interfaith initiatives and social justice efforts and community, community education. All of this is inspired by me, my belief in seva, loving service, that is prayerful and selfless. All of this is rooted in gratitude and that brings me back to my own thankfulness. Thank you all for the wonderful work you do, and thank you all for caring so deeply about making our communities a better and more peaceful place. This, I believe, is our best way forward. Thank you. One of the books that the Peace Center read as a group is The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. And, and it, he says, in order for change to happen, you need three different kinds of entrepreneurial spirits. And the first one he calls connectors. The connectors are people who know everybody and get them together. That's Cappy. Okay. The second kind of person you need is what he calls a maven. A maven is somebody who connects people with technology and with information. That's GP. The third kind of person that's absolutely essential for any kind of social change is a salesman. And that's Lionel Sosa. I first ran into Lionel, and I just reminded him of this back in the 80s, when I was an army captain working for Army Recruiting Command in the sales and advertising department. And he was a subcontractor with Sosa and Associates, his advertising agency that had a part of the Army contract. And we had just changed prime contractors, and he lost the contract through no fault of his own. It was because the prime contractor changed, and he chewed me out for a half hour. And um, so that was my introduction to Lionel Sosa, not sort of um, peace laureate material, either one of us at that time. But oh my gosh, 
The more I learn about this man, the more I respect and admire what he's done. He invented an entire field of advertising. They were the mad men of San Antonio. Mad as in Madison Avenue, not as in Angry Cappy. Um, <laughs> they invented this entire field of Hispanic advertising, and in their heyday, they were bringing in $130 million in advertising revenues here into San Antonio, the international hub of um, advertising. Um, it's, it's been an incredible career he's had um, as a political consultant with major accounts like Coca-Cola and Bud and other, and the U.S. Army and others that you've heard of, um, but he didn't start out that way. He started out doing a term in the Marines. When he came out, he wanted to work for Disney, and he sent them his portfolio, never heard anything, so he got a job working for O.P. Schnabel, you know, his park here in San Antonio, sort of the beautiful city movement, and his job was painting trash cans at $1.75 a can. And um, from that, he started working for a neon design company and then started his own graphic design company, which, as I said, grew into the largest Hispanic advertising agency in the universe with um, um, is tremendous, tremendous taking a quixotic idea and turning it into action. But now his life has taken a different turn. He is a portrait painter. You can't afford him, so don't ask. <laughs> but his real passion now is looking back on his own life. And he started a nonprofit along with his daughter, Christina, who we'll be hearing from in a moment, called Yes, Our Kids Can, which uses technology and all of the advertising and salesman principles that he learned in his long and illustrious advertising career to work on our children, to remind them, to convince them, to talk to their entire families that they have potential, that they might be born poor, but they have potential, that their families might not speak English, but they have potential, that they can do anything that they want to do, that they can be anything that they want to be. Um, it's remarkable, and the early testing, which is being done here in San Antonio, is so positive. I can see this going nationwide, and changing the arc of intergenerational poverty. It is amazing, amazing work from somebody who started out yelling at me when I was living in Chicago. <laughs> um, but I'd like to invite Christina up, and maybe you can tell some um, more stories about Dad. And you give me too much credit. I, I am not a co-founder of Yes, Our Kids Can. Kat, Kathy is, although I think he's tried to hire me a few times. <laughs> I've been like, I'm too busy at SAISD right now. Patty Radel, shout out. Okay. Um, today I have the honor of introducing my father um, as one of today's three city poet lords. And I um, brought up my phone because I, they told me in like three minutes, and I'm like, if I just don't talk without a script, I could go on for 10 minutes, I don't even know. Um, so one of the things I've always admired about him is his um, relentless positivity. <laughs> even uh, He is the eternal optimist. I've never met anybody like him, actually. Um, he really does believe that you can do and achieve anything with the right attitude. Um, and, and with a cheerleader behind you. That's the other key part that, that also believes that you can achieve anything, because that's an important part, too. This is where we're going to tie it to Yes, Our Kids Can. Um, and as his daughter, I have been um, the beneficiary of this unwavering support through my entire life. It's helped me um, in school. It helped me decide that I could apply to Yale and go to Yale. And who knew? I mean, that was a, you know, crazy, crazy thing, but it happened. Um, and then the craziest idea was that my husband and I, we, were, we decided to quit our good paying jobs and we go out to the middle of nowhere, Alpine, Texas, and restore this old building that was about to fall down and turn it into a raspa shop. 
snow cones people and he said that was okay and we could do it and he was our cheerleader i mean that's a little crazy right leaving good job go to the middle of nowhere and do that and in fact he came he was a sign painter and he brought his ladder and he painted the facade of the building for us i have pictures of him doing this 10 years 12 years ago okay i don't know exactly how long it was but um so you, my dad is what you would call self-made. Um, again, he grew up um, the eldest of four uh, on our city's west side, uh, right across from the malt house, what was the malt house, and I think now it's uh, a gas station or something like that. And he, his dad had a dry cleaning business, and he lived behind the dry cleaning business in the house that was attached to it. And in 1957, he graduated from Sydney, Sydney Linear High School, and <laughs> yay, go, go folks. Okay. Um, but one of the things that he always told me and part of the narrative about how, why me and my other siblings, you can go to any school you want, you can do anything you want. Was when I was um, in school, people didn't really believe that people like me or like us could go to college and be successful and have careers. So we weren't even being prepared in school. Like we, we weren't and none of us were. And um, you know, and, and it turns out, you know, no one really believed it, and everyone in the kids and families, maybe they thought, this is for other people, this isn't for us, because we're not seeing anyone around us doing this, you know, and um, so he's like, we need to change that mindset. So, so he became the successful ad man and convinced Latinos to buy Coca-Cola instead of Pepsi, and, um, but all the time that he was doing that, and <laughs> I remember in Luis Miguel was in a video, it was, it was like the, the heyday of um, like Hispanic market advertising. Um, I got to meet Selena, that was cool. Okay, I'm digressing, anyway. Um, but he never forgot where he came from, and there was always, you know, this nagging sense that um, this pervasive unequal opportunity in c communities of poverty. He said, "You know what? I think advertising is all about com changing mindsets. I think I can. I think I can tackle that. I think I can tackle that." That's so. So. So he. So he has. With yes, our kids can. Um, so he decided to use these s skills to convince kids raised in poverty that not only was college something. Um, that, that it was for them and that they could have a good paying job and that there were people that believed in them too. That's the most important part, I think, because you can tell people, go to college, have a great life, but you have to have somebody in your corner, right? Um, so with Yes Our Kids Can, you know, and here he is starting another business at a time when a lot of people are like, you know what, I think I'm just going to retire, relax. He doesn't know how to do that either. I was trying to like reconcile the whole peacemaker thing too, and I, I didn't quite understand that, but now it's making sense to me, you know? I mean, I'm seeing some commonalities here, okay? Um, but this, this program, you know, is designed to disrupt generational poverty with having that success mindset. And the really unique thing about this is that it's bringing the parents into, it's bringing the teachers, and it's repeating it every single day. <laughs> it's doing over and over again. And, <clears throat> and right now, it's already impacting thousands of kids. I don't know exactly how many are in the program, but I know it's at least in seven school districts, including SAISD. Um, and um, while he's doing all of these things, he also finds endless time um, to give to his children, me, and he has eight total <laughs> um, grandchildren. I don't even know exactly how many grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. There's a lot of us. Um, two, of my, two of them are there, Luz and Paloma. Um, and I just, you know, he's a friend. And any place we go in town, everybody knows him. It's like crazy. It's like you sit down in a place and Lionel, Lionel. So, I mean, he's very popular and friendly and outgoing um, but he always has time for us and so I admire him greatly I love him dearly I'm very proud to introduce my dad <laughs> Lionel okay yes didn't cry through the speech yes okay. well I learned a lot from a lot from Christina she is the most joyful person I know and she is the most wonderful uh, mom that can be, and most wonderful wife. And uh, and I'm so proud that you are here with Luz and Paloma, my wonderful grandchildren, and my wonderful son-in-law Vic, and his mom, Janie. Thank you all for being here. We really, I really, really appreciate it. And you know. Uh, all of us know the value of our wives, you know, and how uh, how they 
impact us and how they change us. Uh, I think when I was, uh, uh, I was already in my late 40s when I married Kathy. We've been married 32 years, and uh, but she really did has changed my life. She's taught me I'm not a peaceful man, as you know, all of us. What? What is this? What? Peacemakers, us, why us, you know? And uh, she has taught me a lot how to have peace within uh, the family, myself, and everybody else. She loves everybody. She's, uh, I think, equally positive. Anything that I think is possible, she says, you know it's possible, and she keeps me going every step of the way, so... I thank her every day and all of you every day, fellow peacemakers. The only reason I too am not supposed to be getting an honor like this, but the only reason I accepted was to be in the company of my good friend, Kathy Lawton and Mr. Singh, this very, very distinguished and respected man in the city. Peacemaker. In, in many ways, this really describes most of all San Antonians. We're peacemakers because as a whole, we tend not to be all that suspicious of others. By some strange power, we instinctively trust. In my mind, the only way to have peace is to have compassion. Thank you, Ron, for bringing this whole city and to you and for making it part of this, what this city really re represents, compassion and trust. When we have compassion and trust, we have peace. We have, somehow we have less political strife here. If we disagree, we still break bread together. We're peacemakers. We have less racial tension here than in most big cities. Blacks, Asians, whites, and others get along just fine and work together peacefully. One year we have a white mayor, Phil Hartberger. Next election, a Latino mayor, Julian Castro. Then a black mayor, Ivy Taylor. And now we have our first multiracial mayor, Ron Nuremberg. <laughs> And nobody makes a big deal about it. Most of us don't even notice. We're peacemakers. Why is it that while our black population is only 8%, we still have the largest Martin Luther King March in the whole United States? Why is it that our mostly Mexican Latino population celebrates Fiesta Week with so much joy. After all, Fiesta commemorates the Battle of San Jacinto, the day the mostly white rebels wiped out the Mexicans. <laughs> Why is it that the Dia de los Muertos is embraced by everyone? And now Cappy's all excited about the Dia de los Muertos. <laughs> And it's bigger here than even Mexico City because it is enjoyed by all San Antonians, no matter our race. We're peacemakers. Something else that distinguishes as a city is that while we're Texans, we're not boastful. We're more like the Spurs, a team. Champs without bragging, but knowing who we are and how to celebrate. If we were an NFL ball team, football team, we'd probably be the San Antonio Santos. <laughs> we wouldn't spike the ball after a touchdown. We wouldn't beat our chest. But we'd be champs just the same. So who are we? You know, and I was to say, it's really interesting because so many of us do ask ourselves this question. Who, who are we? We're not Dallas. We're not Houston, we're not LA, we're not Chicago, and we don't want to be. But who are me? Who are we? Maybe we're just San Antonians, San Antonianos. 
open, collaborative, united, joyful, trusting, and compassionate. Peacemakers all. Thank you all peacemakers for making me and the new laureates part of you. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you all so much for those wonderful words of wisdom. And we are graced with a peacemaker, peace laureate, who just was able to make it. Omar Shakir, would you stand up, please? He's a peace laureate past year. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. So don't you think these three peace laureate guys look really handsome today? So I want to invite the Three Peace Laureates to continue rolling up your sleeves. We've got work to do, guys. You think you're just going to leave here and party? Come on up to the podium. Roll up your sleeves. Come on this way. Cappy, GP Singh, Lionel. So every year we try to come up with some kind of um, symbolic memento to give to um, our laureates and it was just it's beautiful to see last year's they have their beautiful robosas on that they, they got last year but um, so it took us a little bit to try to figure this year out what would be the right symbol for the work and uh, I don't think from listening to these three guys that they're going to stop right but we wouldn't be who we are without them doing the hard work the, you know, the spade work that came before. So that's what we decided to give you for those plantings. So this one's GPs. Um, oh my God. <laughs> his name on it. So you can actually use these. You don't hang them on your wall. Um, but to GP for doing all that hard work and continues to do that hard work to knit really together um, the business community and philanthropist and to support that and yet so humbly and so richly. So thank you for that work. And this one goes to Daniel Capwell Lawton. I'll probably hear about that later. Um, but for also doing that hard work and labor, not just to form those third spaces, but to show the rest of us what those look like, right? And even more important, it's that support, and I loved how the two of you talked about the largest family, that support he has given um, to so many people along the way, behind the scenes that we can't necessarily see. Um, but we have pointed to Cappy as the first compassionate business in San, Antonio, in San Antonio, and we'd love to add a long list of businesses to that, so for that hard work. So get ready in a minute for more cameras. I'm just giving you a heads up. So, um, and the last one, of course, to Lionel. Oh my gosh. My sister, who rarely says this word, she leaned over and she said, after that, we can all say amen. And she didn't do that stuff, right? You know, so. Um, but again, all of the, the communication skills, and I am just so um, humbled by the work that you're now doing with our children. Um, you three need to be prepared because I have... And I didn't get on a plane, Susan. That's where I have my biggest ideas. But I have a really big idea, and we'll talk later. But, um, and we're going to need all three to make this work. So for that, 
Um, I want to invite you to kind of stand over here with your, your shovels and maybe folks will take some quick pictures, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys want to stand over here so people can take some pictures? May I just say something? Susan, I, I want you to, will you do my eulogy when I die? <laughs> <laughs> she, she, and, she is phenomenal. Well, I know she is <laughs> Okay, y'all can take your seats again. We'll give you a little respite before you start digging again. <laughs> Isn't it good to see three guys going to work? <laughs> Don't get too comfortable, everybody, here. I want you to roll up your sleeves because we're going to be handing out shovels for each one of you here. The Incarnate Word, okay, start handing out the shovels. Let's go. Incarnate Word volunteers are handing shovels to each of you. The paper shovels that are being handed out are done on seed paper. You can plant them and they'll wildflowers. grow wildflowers in your garden. And here you're going to have some instructions by Anne about what you do with your shovels. So we, we have plenty and everybody can have one. Um, you should have also gotten a pen at your seat. Right, so we wanna invite you somewhere on your paper shovel to, I invite you to print your name because you're not gonna keep this particular shovel, right? So someone else is going to need to be able to read your name. So whether you put that along the handle, like the guy's got, or at the bottom on the face, just if you would put your name on that shovel. People who've been coming to this blessing know that there's always a ritual, and it's different every time. So these shovels are gonna play an important role in that. And while those are being handed out and the names written, we're going to have a song, um, again, by the Circle School. If you didn't get a shovel, make sure you raise your hand and somebody will come by. There's some along the back here, too.
afternoon, compassionate San Antonians. Uh, it is an honor to be with you today. Uh, this Peace Center has been going on for almost three decades now, and the Charter for Compassion movement across the world has been going on for a decade. I believe it's the first time that my family and I came to one of our Peace Laureate events, though, was in 2015 when Rosie Castro was being honored. But since then, so much has been informed by you and so much has changed in our city. I was a city councilman then, now I'm not. <laughs> um, San Antonio has <laughs> officially become a compassionate city, joining so many of others worldwide in the International Charter for Compassion. Equity, compassion, fairness, justice has become part of our policymaking vernacular. And one of last year's laureates, in fact, pushed us forward at this event and then in council chambers and seeing and acting on domestic violence in our community. And it's now one of our city's top key priorities. And perhaps um, in the eight years or so that I've been in City Hall, I have not been more proud ever uh, than when I got a call probably around March, uh, late night from our city manager, Eric Walsh, saying that he had stood up uh, on his own volition, ordered his staff to go ahead and start a migrant resource center because our city was receiving a surge of asylum seekers. And he did so, uh, he called me to inform me that he was doing this, um, not because he had seen um, a request by a council member not because he saw a news report that shamed the city into action, not because he got a call from me urging that kind of action, but because compassion is part of our city's DNA. I've never been more proud to be a member of the city organization than I was that night. Um, and since then, we've served gratefully with our faith community, our nonprofit organizations, organizations like the Catholic Charities and Food Bank and all of you in this room, we helped heal uh, at least momentarily over 30,000 migrants who have dropped off in our city and showed them what San Antonio was all about. So I'm exceedingly proud to be with you tonight as we honor uh, three men who I love greatly, who I admire who I consider almost uh, to be father figures of my own. Uh, it's a great honor to be with you. Congratulations to my dear friends, Cappy, GP, and Lionel. Thank you so much for what you do for our city. It was an honor in my first act as mayor. In fact, I wanted to make sure deliberately that the first ink I put on paper as a mayor of this city was to sign that charter for compassion. And we did that. We did that in June 2017. It was at that point that we all began to understand in the city, in City Hall, and realize that we, yes, are already a compassionate city, as Lionel said. Simultaneously, we know that we can always do better and need to be better at compassion. And that compassion, in fact, is not just words, it is an action. And so in that resolution, we committed as ourselves as a city to learn more about compassion to be about compassion in our daily actions, as well as in our city, policy making and decision making to ensure that compassion, equity, justice, fairness are at the foundation of every decision that we make. So to get us started, uh, just briefly as we get towards the end of our program today, I've brought a video with me to share with you a little bit more about what it means for us to be a compassionate city and to hear examples from a couple of other compassionate cities that we join. Today, we're excited to be celebrating what is arguably the greatest idea humanity has ever had. I wish that you would help with the creation, launch, and propagation of a charter for compassion. That wish was granted sparking a global movement of compassionate action in a polarized world. 
Now, a decade later, the Charter for Compassion wants to share best practices from model compassionate cities to create lasting social change. Many of our inner cities are in turmoil. People are looking for a solution, and compassion is the solution. I think it's really important for the mission of compassionate cities to be spread across the world, particularly now because we know the turbulent times that we live in. Cross-learning between compassionate cities like San Antonio, Monterey and Las Vegas has been a key to delivering remarkable results. One initiative from a group of godmothers in compassionate city Monterey is rebuilding lives, one roof at a time. So Las Vegas has its dark side, as any city does. Behind those images, there is a very compassionate heart. Life on the street can be brutal. And so if you're always in survival mode, we offer a place of safety and a place of respite where people can come, be safe, decompress, and then start moving towards their next steps. Really, when I think of our corridor of hope, I think of outstretched arms ready to embrace. Across town, a volunteer-driven medical clinic heals the uninsured, while a food bank feeds the hungry. I used to be part of that vulnerable population. I, was, um, I went without health care. I was homeless for a long time. Compassion heals. Compassion empowers. Compassion changes lives. I'm, I'm a direct result of that. The city has also struck an innovative partnership between police and pastors to reduce violent crime. After a violent event, say a homicide or a shooting, we will call our faith-based partners. Uh, they will come out and respond as a kind of a conduit to us to really preach no retaliation, provide aid and comfort to the family. The first year that we started this model, we saw a 40% reduction in murders and a 56% reduction in shootings. Compassion is truly the key component to save lives, bring down gang violence, and the suffering that's in our inner city. Y el intercambio de, de políticas públicas que nos eh, que nos hayan sido efectivos tanto allá como en, en nuestra ciudad, creo que es muy importante para poder fortalecer más este trabajo de ciudades compartidas. Through the spread of Compassionate Cities initiatives, innovation blossoms and people flourish. So it's a powerful way to unleash five things, inspiration, initiative, integration, innovation, and impact. Compassion is the antidote to suffering, period. It's what allows people to have hope that there's a better day tomorrow. Invertir en la compasión en este momento de la historia es invertir en la sanación del planeta. In order to infuse and, and really uh, expand compassion across our world, or across our communities, uh, we need more people to reach in their pockets and realize that it's going to have a ripple effect across the world and make it a better place. The Charter for Compassion has a new wish for the next 10 years. To shine a light on compassionate cities whose measurable results inspire others around the world. You can help. 
Invest in compassion and cross-learning between communities. If we aren't, as individuals, as organizations, as cities, as communities, investing in that for our future generations, we are so missing the mark. This is the best stuff that's happening on the planet. You should be very proud that the Peacemakers movement here in San Antonio is providing an example for the world. Um, in one of my other roles, I serve as chairman of Sister Cities International that links together thousands of American cities with counterparts overseas to exemplify citizen diplomacy, how we create peace by bringing people on the ground together, despite what our national politics are doing. And through that network, we have actually uh, begun to move the Charter for Compassion throughout our international sister cities. And I'm happy to say that although Monterey, as you saw on the video, kind of beat us to the punch, they were one of the first signers of the Charter. Uh, we've been working with them to advance our own sister city relationships. And since then, uh, we have uh, signed up on the Charter Darmstadt, Germany, one of our sister cities, as well as Kumamoto, Japan. That's three so far. And we're planning to, planning to uh, get a lot more of our sister cities on board as well. In giving one last example of this global potential, Compassionate Monterey, our sister city, our very first sister city, challenged us this past October in planting tens of thousands of trees as they had done in 2019. San Antonio said yes, of course, we are part of that, we, we will take the challenge. And so today I'm officially announcing that San, the San Antonio Compassion Tree Project, the planting of 20,000 trees in 2020 all across our city on behalf of Compassion San Antonio. So this is a perfect example of how we can show our community how compassion grows. It grows through collaboration, working together towards a greater good. In this case, the greater good is the sustaining of our planet so that all future generations can continue to enjoy our blue sky. The collaboration involves our city departments like Parks and Rec, Human Services, Metro Health, and the Office of Sustainability, and involves many of our congregations and schools. It involves your businesses, it involves our libraries, and it involves you and me with our shovels to plant individual trees in our yards, if you have one, to encourage and participate in planting in groves at schools, congregations, and our places of work. All said, in honor of their commitment to San Antonio and being named our three new Peace Laureates, we do have three mountain laurels here that are gifts to, from the city to GP, Lionel and Cappy, so we have 19,997 to go. <laughs> so, and likewise, in honor of the 25 years that the Peace Center has been leading our efforts in our city and now doing business as Compassionate San Antonio, hashtag Compassionate SA, use that as much as you can whenever you see an act of compassion. We begin officially together the San Antonio Compassion Tree Project, and these three trees will get us started. Uh, we have all heard the proverb before. It goes, the mark of a compassionate, enlightened society is when old men plant trees in whose shade they will never sit. That's our job. We are better people when we work and plant together. We are the best of people when what we are planting in this world is compassion. Thank you all very much for being San Antonio. So the real reason you all came, right, is for the blessing. Um, and so we're going to spend about the next couple minutes, as we like to do, greeting each other and exchanging your shovels. And as we do that, we have words, of course, to go with that. Um, we'll do it again. We're just going to pretend we didn't do this. Bless you for the work. Excuse me. Bless you for your work.
You can count on me. And you can count on me. Okay. Bless you for your work. Okay. So that's how we're going to do for the next couple minutes. But just keep exchanging the shovels and keep the last one you've swapped. Okay? Did we make sense? Okay. <laughs> Okay, you're right. And if we could have your attention just for a couple moments more. We're going to run through this quick. Should we stand up here? Let's stand up here. They can just be where they are. Did you see how I fell on the stage? I did see that. Oh, great. Please don't so we have a couple quick announcements. If you could just have, we could have your attention this way, and then you could just keep hugging, okay? So, mark your calendars. Next year's date is January 31st. Same time, same place. January 30th. I got the this, we're moving on. <laughs> the other thing we'd like to share with you is the Joan Boryasenko event that is coming up this uh, February, this next month. And it's about uh, mind and body practices and being compassionate to yourself and to your neighbors. So practicing compassion with mind, body, and spirit. Also, you should have received on your chairs, and if you haven't heard about it, uh, there's a card in there about sacred.org. S-A-C-R-D, it's one letter short of sacred, the word, but it's pronounced like, well, sacred. But um, it is the 24-7, 365 access into direct compassionate care in our city. There's a uh, table outside and you can find out more about that. Sa I said that. San Antonio Community Resource Directory. All right, and I know you're all excited about getting the, the Heartwood book, which is right outside the doors there. The book releases today and it is um, the collected wisdom of our Peace Laureates who were published, some of them were published in the Express News between May and October of last year. So as an anniversary special, the books are $10 each, two for $20, or three for $25. So if you buy three books, you save $5, and you can spend the $5 on some compassion beads. Also, all the laureates are going to be staying in this area, so once you buy your books, if you want them to autograph, you can come back in here and they'll autograph those for you. 
We also have some books from Material Media about Wangari, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for planting trees in Kenya, Africa. Thank you all for coming today. Have great years. Bless you for your work. You can count on us. Yeah. Start working on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. All 96. <laughs> okay. All right.